everyone, and welcome to episode number four of Really Bad Security. Uh, I am joined, as always, by Anthony and Lloyd from the Really Bad Security team. And uh, today we're going to be joined by, or we are joined by Sean Katora and Jimmy Mesta from Signal Sciences. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is uh, software development in the real world, how things actually work. Uh, a little bit about developer empathy, and then uh, we will certainly talk about um, how an improper uh, implementation of DevSecOps in your environment can truly be really bad security. So with that, Jimmy, let me pass things over to you to, for introductions. And then um, we talked a little bit earlier, so let's let's continue down the, the conversation that we started offline about um, deconstructing some of the notions uh, uh, around the AppSec echo chamber. So with that, Jimmy, I pass it over to you. Let's do it. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for letting me talk about the AppSec echo chamber. I think, uh, I think being part of really bad security, I, uh, as I read the, the meeting intro invite, I was like, what is this again? Like, oh yeah. <laughs> um, it makes a lot of sense though. So my name is Jimmy. Um, I, uh, for, formerly known as the Director of Security Research at Signal Sciences, now Senior Manager of Security at Fastly. So um, Sean and I are going through, uh, um, basically went through an acquisition. And uh, I've been in Six i for a little under a year, but have been in the AppSec infrastructure security, uh, air quotes, DevSecOps sort of space now for uh, about, 12 years doing this. So, um, and it's gone through a lot of changes and it's been a lot of fun, but it's also been a roller coaster. Uh, and I'm happy to sit and talk about what I've seen and some of the opinions, I guess I've formulated over those, over those years. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I would say we, so we hear this conversation come up a lot and, and throughout the course of the year, I would say DevSecOps, we hear the, the phrases and the terms a lot. Um, and maybe this is some of the echo chamber. Um, I, I like that hashtag AppSec echo chamber. I think that'll be in the description. But um, so so let's 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 try to break it down uh, some because I do feel like people throw that term out there and oh that just means throwing in some secure code or oh we just need to get our developers thinking security. I think there's a lot of um, uh, bad ideas but you know there's some misconceptions that's the word i was looking for out there about what devsecops means so maybe maybe let's just start there like in your mind what does it even mean to do devsecops yeah fair um and as a disclaimer before any of this uh i think the intentions behind most of these movements if you will are are good right uh, i think that that's that's the plan um with that things have, you know, companies, et cetera, have taken advantage of this new buzzword to their own financial gain. So we'll just leave it at that. But I have a two day DevSecOps course that I taught in a past life. So this is not me saying like DevSecOps is bad. I've made a living off of part of this uh, thing that we call DevSecOps. Um, and I think I had a, I came up with a, one sentence definition of it actually in my training it's like if i can remember it's a uh, devsecops is the process of incorporating meaningful security controls without slowing down deployment or development velocity something like that um and that's basically i still stand behind that right uh if you know it, it to do devsecops is to kind of release yourself of that uh phrase in general and just collaborate Just do the thing and work, yeah, yeah right. work with development teams like it's not about being like so many places i go have devsecops teams um and i'm not sure that's the right approach right it's not about hiring the firing squad and just like hey like we're doing it now because this person's title is devsecops uh right. It, it's not quite so that. what what's the root so let's get let's get to like what the root of of the problem is right so um, we're having people who very quickly in the DevOps uh, world need to uh, rapidly, re uh, you know, write and produce code. Um, and that inherently uh, leads to some possible security holes, vulnerabilities. Um, so what, how do we as security practitioners get in there 
um, and you know make make that process better again without slowing down that 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 production. That's yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the root, right? It's um, at the end of the day, we still have uh, a smattering of the OWASP top ten sitting on the internet, right? XSS, SQL I, things that we've uh, my entire career have just been like really like script alert XSS, like that's just happening in this right. random field. And uh, I think first we have to accept that that's just our reality and the bugs are getting more complex and the implications now with everything being API driven, uh, tons of data in the cloud, all these things, uh, the implications of some of these like web phones or misconfigurations are just insane compared to 10 years ago. So, um, those are going to happen, but developers, as you said, are now being asked or placed into this kind of agile sort of world where we're embracing automation and TDD and, and these things that are helping us like go from commit to production in minutes versus quarters. Uh, that has changed the way security has to deal with things. Before, I feel like we had time there's a major release coming, give us a week or two, we're going to do our thing, our fancy stuff, and we're going to go back and say there's bugs. But now um, that certainly doesn't work. So that's the problem space, I think, is how do we take the old security model and like plug it into what developers and DevOps oper operators are already doing? I don't know if you yeah, agree. So that, the, that feels like the problem to me, at least. So, so is the way to do this then to... Or maybe it's maybe it's all of the all of the above that I'm about to mention. Is it to help developers write more secure code, or is it to make sure that security is a part of that process? So as they're rapidly, you know, uh, doing what they need to do, that we're able to quote unquote, you know, keep up with with what they're doing. Yeah, um, maybe we'll we can start with the wrong way. Right, because it's yeah. really bad security. So, right. um, or, or at least my opinion of the wrong way. I feel like this might get some backlash for some of this later, but um, that's okay. the The things that I have have tried and failed at are the the typical. I mean, we, we've been talking about DevSecOps for it's got to be like seven or eight years. I'm making that number up, but it's not like yesterday there for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and everybody has been to a conference talk at least once in their lives where it's like they draw a pipeline and it's like scan your code run dynamic analysis do this thing do dependency checking like and like just go do that and you're doing DevSecOps. um and the minute you start breaking builds the minute you start slowing things down the minute you start throwing things back to devs that aren't fully understood and you're not taking that hit for at least trying to fix it or coming up with a pull request or some some way to like help the problem, um, you're going to get worked around very quickly. Like it's very easy for developers to figure out a way to get their work done without your security thing. Um, right. We need to come to them is essentially what you're saying. Pretty much. I, I mean, I think like we need to, and then like two years ago, Loco Moco sec, James Wicket was like, all security engineers should know how to develop code, write code. And like that caused a ripple around the Twitter sphere of like, no, I don't write code. And other people are like, yeah, that, I agree. And that's where we stand. It's like, I think we're a little bit understaffed. We all know that. And um, the ability for us to contribute in a meaningful way back to the problem without just handing over this piece of paper Right. Uh, there's a lot of security people that don't do that, right? And and we're not built like usually operationally to even have that kind of skill set. So I think that's yeah. when I don't like I don't I don't I've never been a huge fan of sweeping notions like that. Like all security engineers need to know how to write and read code. I mean, yeah. if you're if you're working in healthcare, if you're working at a business who has no development operations whatsoever, I mean, yeah, it can help me reverse engineer malware and you know. You do static analysis and things of that nature, but I don't. I don't need to write code in in, in my day to day job. Well, there's, yeah. I mean, there's lots of security people that can make an entire career without writing code. Yeah, right. Hundred <laughs> um, percent. And I think that's what caused so much. 
but the conversation was worth having, right? It's like, yeah. um, whether well, it's never yeah. like a one, a all or nothing, but I think that statement caused enough, like, oh, you know, the, you know, the root of the problem is we're trying to fix code. And like, if nobody's understanding code at all, it becomes a little bit. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Disconnected. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there probably has to be some level of understanding. Right. And then I think the flip side of that um is you know turning all of your developers into security people which I, i'm not sure that always works either right i mean because I, I, because i have work. seen well we're just gonna and i was like no that's also not gonna happen so um there's definitely a balance right i mean we need we need our developers to not write not write gigantic holes in their code but we you know we can't expect them to you know 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 everything especially about you know security when when their job is to get the product out the door. Yeah, yeah, trying to push it all back uh, is tough. And you know, there's a middle ground that I've seen work pretty well um, is kind of having the, you know, and it's not a new notion either, is the security champion model where you're like, you know, you're gonna, your ratio for AppSec engineers to regular developers is going to be terrible, right? So it, it, it's always abysmal. That, that's just a fact of life. Um, but if you can pick the right projects, the right teams, the right kind of cadence to get people on the security team involved at a longer, like a longer term engagement internally um, to help with some new SSO thing that you're building or whatever, like it has to make sense for them, but um, that can work. And it's almost like a consulting firm, but it's internal, which is right. much better. Uh, and, you know, that way, developers are seeing into your mind and into the like security problems day to day versus like, here's app, here's like your annual AppSec training on the OWASP top 10. That's, that's good as a train, someone who's done training, like you need baseline knowledge, but that's only going to get you so far. Yep. Yeah. We, I mean, we, <clears throat> we talked about that recently with security awareness training too, right? Like you, that's got to go beyond October. <clears throat> so so I guess to that point, for companies that are struggling with, with figuring out how to implement a DevSecOps program, um, you know, I mean, we, we kind of talked through it a little bit there of maybe there's a way to do it from a blended standpoint. But, you know, if someone is at square one and they're like, hey, we've been doing development, but it's, you know, it's not worked out. We haven't been able to get the security piece into it. Like, do you have some recommendations or some thoughts for companies that are just like literally at square one of, of starting this? and some things that they could do. Right. Or some quick wins that are like, you know, maybe yeah. simpler or, you know, things that just get the ball rolling. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it's again, like semi buzzwordy, but I do like the notion of guardrails. Like, so even we look at Kubernetes, right. And like the adoption of all these kind of pretty heavy handed cloud native deployment kind of methodologies and Docker and all these things, serverless, uh, most of the time what I'm seeing in big companies is that that's abstracted away to the nth degree from the a developer, right? They, they're just going to write code. They have like four different configurations, none of which can put you in a really bad state. Um, and that path to production is, it's got guard, like it's got brick walls around it. Like you can't go around it and, and do things that are totally egregious. Uh, that's a decent start. Um, then you can argue like, is that a free to fail environment? Are we get really empowering developers? And sure, um, that's true too. But then, uh, you know, there, there's kind of the, the pillars of what we would call DevSecOps, I guess, would be like cultural and then like technology and automation. And the technology and automation is the one that everybody wants to buy their way out of or like turn a tool on. And, and we've all seen this, right? Like every training I've ever done somebody at the very top is like, yeah, that was really scary and great and awesome. But like, can you just like, what's the best tool to just kind of like, <laughs> can I buy this? Right. Yeah. Can I buy all the stuff you said and like, um, and it's so hard to be like, absolutely not. Right. Like, and that's, that's the answer I always have. And it's like, yeah, you can experiment with tools once you have a lot of other things in place. So um, automation can start start small, right? Like you can do things out of band from the rest of 
the the pipeline just to just to like see what's happening have visibility signal sciences like we've always been good at that visibility thing observability where it's like we can do a lot without breaking everything in the process um simple static analysis linting things that can be done early um, um, I um I yeah I, yeah i see you but like, <laughs> i want to talk right now okay star of the show love it <laughs> 2020 vibes um right <laughs> um can you shut that dude okay i'll be i'll be right back okay <laughs> the best um <laughs> well you know you gotta have your vitamin he didn't have his vitamin yet um, oh yeah <laughs> so it's it's important but anyway well, your reason to, to right. i mean when you're three you don't there's this isn't a thing so um <laughs> the yeah so like you can start to experiment with automation um but there is no one tool you can buy in in my mind that will help you in this endeavor right even the biggest companies who have all these tools still are susceptible to all sorts of things that are just like get, leave you scratching your head cvs from years and years ago and like they they bought the snicks they bought the the contrast, whatever the tool is, like right. they're paying a lot of money for, it's not, it doesn't matter because legacy system is legacy system and it's sitting there doing its thing. So, right. Well, it's uh, the same thing. I, I like that because that translates into all aspects of InfoSec, right? Not just dev is, is we, we can have the tools, but it's not your silver bullet because there is no such thing as a silver bullet. And yeah. so to, to translate that into, into this conversation, I think is incredibly appropriate. Well, and I think the other thing too is, you know, our, our audience is, you know, anything from very, very small mom and pop type organizations to some of the largest uh, enterprises in West Michigan. So, you know, there's, if, if you just, if the answer is always a tool, a software or something, right, that, that's just beyond the reach of some organizations to even be able to do. So I think talking through security, I mean, really good security is always talking through processes and procedures and, and other things, and then finding maybe the tool or the solution that fits into what it is that you're doing. So I like, uh, I like the idea of what you said about, you know, just even starting with, it's like static code analysis, right? Um, so where do you see that responsibility sitting with with the security side of things or you know through through the developer like like because that that i think that's a uh, you know a great uh, avenue to to start this you know and actually looking at the problem line by line and you know trying to piece together where the holes might be yeah um you know, static analysis has also been in the hot seat, I feel like, for the past couple of years. That and dynamic analysis. I think there's a lot of companies. I've seen much of this where I'll, uh, it's, it's kind of like we bought the thing, we hired a team, we, we, we're, we're doing static analysis, and um, the actual people who have to deal with the output are not any happier. They're not any more secure. They're just now have this stack of papers, if you will, or tickets uh, in JIRA that are labeled in some abstract fashion to like go fix a thing that they didn't write because they're pulling it from somewhere that whatever, oh, like, right. some, you know, I find static analysis to be very, uh, I don't know, it's just like misunderstood, right? Like you can, you know, at Signal Sciences, you look at our Go code base and it's like, is the static analysis going to be the answer here with like millions of lines of code that are sprawled out all over these microservices? And like, yeah, you're going to find, um, you know, like the PHP, uh, like or exec style things that are very obvious. And it's like, okay, that's great. But let's trace that back to the end user. It is it exploitable. So there's like a lot of work that needs to be done. Again, for me, the security team should take the hit. If you're running the tool, you're getting the output. 90% of them might be false positives or, or just like totally ineffective. Um, you, it, it's your responsibility as a person who's running the scan, dealing with the output to like actually validate, is this real and demonstrate why. And then a developer is going to be able to put that in their 
backlog of things and prioritize it and get it done unless it's no yeah absolutely i like that because there is definitely a a, a culture of well I identified this vuln that i stand for and here go fix it so so it still absolutely. exists like that's yeah, a lot right. that's a culture that's been yeah. a long time coming and i was just looking up a book i was reading from greg van vandergas called rethinking infosec it's like not um yeah it's not ter- there's like two part series it's like blog post style but he kind of relates security which i thought was appropriate as a car like pretend you had like a car manufacturer and you decided to like build the cars on the second story and the cars got like the final part of the uh the assembly line they got launched out of the building into the parking lot <laughs> over and over for years and everyone's like yeah, our stuff's kind of broken and like our cars keep breaking and like um, that's kind of like how he equates it to InfoSec yeah. where like these problems are systemic, right? If like somebody stood back and they're like, why aren't you doing this on the ground floor or like have a ramp? And then everyone would be like, it's a good idea. So it's, it's AppSec, right? It's like, what are the frameworks we're using? What are the, the ways that we we query databases? Like all, all these things that lead to SQLi and like, and kind of client side vulnerabilities, I feel like can you can have that conversation that like the framework language. Right. So not just the code, level. so to speak. The whole like it's the not, whole thing. Like, yeah, right. Found it in production and using a DAS tool. It's like you're just you know whacking playing whack-a-mole, right? It's like and you'll do that forever. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I really like that analogy. It was like, yeah, that feels like InfoSec most days. It's like we're just crashing cars over and over without thinking about the core of the problem that is true um yeah i wrote down the title of that book we will put a we'll put that in the uh, description of the video as well if anybody wants to go out and find that book um i I think i like what you said about infosec taking the hit uh, or security taking the hit because you know i think that another thing here is you know oftentimes i think development teams or development people more easily outsourced they may be coming from multiple locations you may have people from different companies uh that that you've outsourced working on the same um same project so i i I think if um you know if you want to have someone kind of overseeing that process it probably should certainly be your internal security people um i would say that's probably outsourced a lot less although we're starting to see a little bit of of security being outsourced as well, but probably not nearly as much as development is. So keep that in-house, at least the oversight of that stuff, I guess would be my thoughts. Unless yeah. you didn't. And look like we're expensive people and we are thin, fickle folks, right? Like it, it's not easy to just, it's easy to say, go build an AppSec team that's gonna be able to do this. But in practice, that's that's really hard. Like it's, you know, especially if you're a mid-sized company and like, it's a big investment, um, but I'd also say if you're if you're put it, if your whole business model is based off of using the, people using the internet and using your applications from the internet and using these technologies, like it's the same as hiring a developer, right? It's like you need you need that expertise, and it doesn't have to be full time. Even like there are definitely ways to augment your security um, while you grow. Well, and that, and the same thing was true with <laughs> just any InfoSec, right? I mean, for, for the longest time in the 90s, early 2000s, it, we were, it was IT people only. Like InfoSec wasn't, I mean, the, you had people who, <laughs> you know, were, were a little hacky or hackery or, you know, or whatever, but there were no cybersecurity engineers, or InfoSec engineer jobs. It's only really in the last 10, 15 years that that has even been a thing so I, I you know i agree so that'll probably end up you know being the case long term as well with with AppSec. so being that we're cloud security alliance um jimmy have you is there uh i guess maybe even from a signal sciences perspective or fastly do we have to get are you guys going to stick with the sig side or are we going to have to change over how we're referring to you guys uh Time to be determined. <laughs> um, you'll you'll know there'll be some some big press release. So yeah, yeah. For now we're Signal Sciences, um, and as part of Fastly. So right. 
So with, you know, so I guess when we look at development, you've got, you know, whether it's web development or there could be internal applications, do you, are, are there differences in thought processes, procedures, things that you see for people that are building, you know, either apps or websites for the web versus stuff that they're doing, you know, maybe internally or things that people should look at? Are there things that they should maybe look at differently depending on where the application is sitting? Oh man, I mean, that's a, a great topic and one of a, a lot of friction in my past at least is like you can find a lot of problems with internal apps and most people will write them off, right? They're like, it's internal, like yeah. that, but it's good. Like, yeah, we're good, right? Yeah, like only the people we trust can access it. Um, and, you know, there's some degree of truth to that, right? There, it's not, it's the difference between like, yeah, your internal CRM thing versus like having a site like Facebook, right? Where anybody can sign up, do all these things. Um, but on the flip side, I kind of like the zero trust model, right? Like, like beyond like technical zero trust implementations with like endpoints and things like that, but like what's internal is now external. And in the world of like subcontractors, third-party APIs, like uh, just the, the growth of company, like, the, I don't know, like, like it doesn't just, feel it doesn't like in, weak, even just a weak perimeter, right? I mean, just cause it's internal doesn't mean somebody's gonna act yeah. from the outside. Yeah, we, we've done that. Like, like, we're like, well, you're on the VPN, so you're good, right? And it's like, you don't need to do all these extra things. And that, I think that era is uh, thankfully gone, right? It's like, that's not how the world works anymore. I mean, you've seen, we've seen breaches from like HVAC vendors, right? Like through their network that, you know, there was a site to site VPN into this bigger network and that's all it takes, right? So right. Um, internal is the new external and those things, uh, even web app volumes like the coolest ones I think are coming from the outside. You submit a SQL I payload or XSS or whatever, or CSRF, that data ends up in an internal system or, or an internal view that has no security features, right? It's like, like oh, this is our like God mode yeah, thing. Yeah. And like, <laughs> that's the best. And then yeah. now we can implement like uh, kind of canary tokens to know that that triggered way in the back end somewhere that we'll never see, but it's like, yeah, that's not good because odds are if it's an internal system, we have less IDS, IPSE types of things. We have less logging, less monitoring, less uh, rigor with AppSec. Um, and you could just totally annihilate um, something from the inside. So uh, yeah, I would say definitely be wary of internal systems. So yeah, no, I appreciate you saying that. I, I think that uh, the, not to have an echo chamber, but to that echoes a lot of the sentiments that we've been talking about lately. I mean, um, I, I feel like in some ways, uh, we're seeing more holes or more ways to enter and become an insider than maybe ever before. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of stuff that's happening, um, kind of literally as we speak right now, as well as, you know, just um, vendor accounts and other things that are constantly being compromised. And maybe they don't attack you because you're a big company and they know you have a good solid security team, but they find out who your downline vendors are, they attack them, and then they find their way in through that a million different ways for people to get inside. So um, I, I too uh, yeah. say treat, treat, treat your inside systems like they're outside systems because chances are pretty good. They probably um, are or will be at some point. So, um, I mean, like, just third-party packages, right? It's like, if somebody wants inside, they just, we've seen this, like literal hackers, like I'll take over that super popular NPM package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're burnt out, I got it. And they just put yeah. a Bitcoin or a, a Monero cryptocurrency miner in it and send an update to millions of people who use this thing and you're on the inside to some degree, right? It's right. like um, the AWS metadata endpoint. Nobody thought when that came about years and years ago that that would just become this like huge headache for everybody. It's like SSRF, yeah, that, like that's an internal endpoint. It's not supposed to be external to the world. It's not supposed to act like this. And now we're going back in time and trying to figure out how to like protect ourselves from, yeah, just like gooey insides. Like it's like, yeah, the perimeter is weak. 
I even go back to, and maybe it's just because I kind of grew up through being an Active Directory person, but think of the amount of companies that are running on the same Active Directory for the last 20 years and the mess that a 20-year-old Active Directory is. So just getting on the inside and knowing that if, if anybody does get on the inside, you have credentials with way too much permission. I guarantee it, every single company does. Um, so as soon as someone gets inside, you know, they they're going to have access to your apps and everything else probably. So yeah. hospitals um, are the, the worst of that. <laughs> Not by, you know, like it's just, that's the type of network hospitals you could plug into the ethernet Jack in the waiting room and bad things can happen. Access so. the server VLAN. Right. <laughs> yeah. I see, I see Lloyd acknowledging that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I used to do, yeah. I used to do hospital assessments. It's insane. Like if you, carry a clipboard around you basically are network admin it doesn't like it doesn't even right yeah <laughs> right so we always like to to you know we we in really bad security episodes we talk a lot about some of the you know the the, the bad stuff that's out there but we always like to end them on some positive notes and i know we we talked a little bit about you know hey if you're just getting started here's maybe some things to think about but um paint for us a bit of a picture of a, a healthy dev secops environment what it looks like, how that operates, and then what the benefits of actually doing this correctly look like as well. Yeah, um, I will try. So the- uh, Doesn't exist. That's <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> we can strive towards things. Um, so the number one, like throw the year long tool search kind of aside for now, right? Like that, that's not the important thing. Um, to, t to tackle day one. Um, and then the second piece is uh, actually, we had a, a, one of our senior managers at, at Fastly giving a talk yesterday on, um, it was just on uh, code reviews, uh, uh, like pull requests and how to, how to do code reviews, um, how they do it on their team. And it was less technical, but more of like, a session on developer empathy, right? Like in, I feel like that translates to DevSecOps more where if you're, assume, assume people did things for a reason and assume that that reason was the best intention at the time, right? And start with that mental model and then ask the questions on like, where's the world today? And what can we do with that system or series of systems or that code base to, to either make it better as it stands, rewrite it or put controls in place around it, right? And do you even have to? There's plenty of places and plenty of things that are low enough uh, on the risk tolerance level that maybe it isn't a tomorrow thing and maybe you don't have to lose sleep over it. So it really like the empathy piece is, you know, culturally much more important than just putting in, you know, kind of speed bumps and roadblocks along the way. Um, and yeah, assuming good intention, I think is, is step two. And then, you know, step three is like, you should experiment with these things, right? Like if you have a plan to, you know, pick a, pick a class of vulnerabilities, like I want to, we're, we're seeing problems with injection or we have a PHP apps. And so I know that there's, has PHP problems, like pick an area, focus on it and experiment with tools, but also just like read the code and figure out like, what can we do maybe by building uh, certain libraries that can be pulled to use that are secure, like going back to the source, right? Shifting left, if you will. Um, what can we do to, to build base images for our Docker deployments that are hardened, right? Instead of just like letting people pull from wherever they feel, cause they're gonna do that to get their job done. Um, we see a lot of success in that, or, you know, we, we, we're moving towards a better uh, security story when we as a security team can at least have some sort of uh, control or at least awareness of those packages, repos, whatever. Um, so yeah, those would be the three things. Um, and honestly, like drop your ego at the door, right? Just like, there's literally like, so many questions to ask and there's no security person that knows all the answers and the ones that do should be yeah stay away from them 
<laughs> don't don't hire them. You can probably as with off. as with all things security, I think you know you you alluded to it and have said it a couple of times. It starts with culture. So that's it. Gotta have the right culture and uh, grow grow up from there. Without that foundation, you're <laughs> you're uh, not not in for a good time. No, and assume developers don't want to write insecure code, right? They don't like that's not part of. Well, <laughs> Because like a developer, it's like, man, I just like really trying to make this thing fully vulnerable to SQL I because that'll be cool, right? Because that like no one wants that. So um, assume they're on your team and be on theirs is the kind of the, the parting message. Yeah, this this company hired me and I cannot wait to make their system super vulnerable. I think it's yeah. not what actually goes on. There, right? Unless you're doing some big social engineering thing like that. Yeah, which could be, but that's typically not the case. So. Developers are good people. I think that's the lesson that we've learned here. And as security people, we need to support what they're doing. So, We're all just trying to figure this thing out, man. It's not a, no one has all the answers. So. We're all one big blue team. Yeah, you know, Anthony, we had this conversation the other day, right? Where, where the, the bad guys have to find one thing. And they can just hunt and hunt and hunt until they find that one thing. You know, we are constantly guessing as to how to keep them from finding that one thing. It's, it's much more difficult and we're a lot better off when we're not fighting each other, but actually working together. So, all right. So, so properly done DevSecOps, we have learned today can help your company produce better code, pr produce it, probably produce it faster. And certainly with a lot less security issues on the back end. Doing this incorrectly can not only produce really bad code, but can also be really bad security. So with that, Jimmy, Sean, I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time and spending that with us. Anyone that's watching this, like, subscribe. I learned a new thing this week. Click the little button so that you know when we have a new video that comes out. Um, I'm getting younger and cooler every day. Um, with that, Anthony Lloyd, thanks as always. And we'll see you guys again for episode number five. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Oh,